Today's interview is with a captain in the public health service that works for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And he is going to be telling us about the amazing opportunities that are available within that organization for PAs and NPs. Hello, uh, my name is Captain Christian Rathke. I'm a PA and I'm the director for Total Worker Health in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA. I love that. I don't know why, I guess because I'm a nerd, but NOAA has always fascinated me ever since I was little. I always wanted to be an oceanographer. But for people who may not really know much about NOAA, can you kind of briefly just tell us what NOAA does? NOAA's mission is really to better understand our natural world and help protect its resources extended beyond the national borders to monitor global weather and climate uh, around the world. In addition to that, fisheries management, coastal restoration and supporting marine commerce. So it's pretty big. NOAA does a lot that people don't know about. So you said that you were in the public health service and that you are serving with NOAA. What is the public health service? So in the United States, we currently have eight different uniform services. The Commission Corps of the United States Public Health Service is one of those eight uniform services. And so as a uniform service, I do wear a uniform and we have many of the same benefits that the rest of our sister services have. In terms of what we do in the public health service, we provide essential healthcare services, particularly to underserved and vulnerable populations. We deploy across the planet for public health emergencies, lead public health programs and policy development, research research, regulatory type of work, and then NOAA, which, of course, we're going to talk about a little bit more here. NPs can do this as well, correct? Most definitely NPs uh, as well. Let's talk about NOAA specifically. Like, what do PAs and NPs do in NOAA? In NOAA specifically, uh, the primary role, if I were to put a, a PAs and NPs into a category of medicine uh, within NOAA specifically, would be occupational medicine. Um, but within that, it's pretty broad, and there are some very specialized PAs and MPs. It could be a focus on aviation medicine, dive medicine, marine medicine, behavioral health. Um, if you have that behavioral health certification and background, that's just a, a sliver of some of the specialties that have um, that we have, and we train individuals towards that. Cool. We'll send people to dive medical school to aviation medical school. Behavioral health is something people come in or pick up uh, on their own, um, but lots of opportunities. When you talked about dive medicine, I've, I've been a, a diver since I was 16, and I would love to work in dive medicine. But my first thought was, I'm already 53. What are the age limits and the requirements uh, to get in the public health service? Do you know? So the general criteria are is a graduation from accredited program as a PA, NCC PA board certification, you have to meet fitness standards, uh, which include medical fitness standards as well. And then there are some age caps. Uh, criteria typically for uniform services, they don't want you to be Medicare eligible before you reach eligibility for retirement. Trust me, I already, I already know. I, I just, you know, I became a PA just way, way too late in life. <laughs> and so I didn't oh, well. discover all of this stuff until a little later, uh, which is part of why I want to do this channel to help people understand the time limits, the things that they want to do. We'll talk one, one more thing about the public health service, and then we'll move on specifically to working in NOAA. But how does the salary compare in the public health service to the civilian side? There's a couple things to, to consider. One is, is that, of course, you can look at the military pay charts, and that applies to all the uniform services. And you look at the rank that you would come in, and that's your base salary. And over time, you get promoted as you work up through the ranks. But that's just the beginning. You also have housing allowances, as well as at different times throughout your career, depending on shortages for healthcare staff. Right now, there's a really big shortage for healthcare providers across the country. And so there are incentive bonuses, uh, retention bonuses. There's also board certification pays. And so once you start to look at the total compensation package, that paints a much different picture. But then you also look over the longevity of your lifetime as well and what your retirement package looks like in the uniform service. And you'll find that the pension and the type of health care that you're going to, you know, insurance that you'll get really offsets that too. So if you look over a lifetime, it's a pretty amazing compensation package to do something that you absolutely love and to give back to the community and to your, your country. So I, I, I have no complaints on compensation. So you said that PAs and NPs working in NOAA are primarily doing uh, occupational medicine. 
Now, what are the settings? Like, I know Noah has these big, beautiful ships that I've always wanted to be on. Uh, are the are the PAs and NPs? Are any of them working on the ships? Are they all on like land based clinics, or are they out in the field somewhere, or is it a variety? It's the full spectrum. Currently, we have fifteen different ships. Um, it's the largest federal scientific fleet, and, and we travel the world. PAs and MPs absolutely travel on those ships. Sometimes they're away for as many as, as two months at a time when they're traveling, and they're the sole provider. Wherever that ship is, anywhere on the planet, they're it. They're the first and last stop for anything that would happen on that ship underway. Lots of opportunities to participate and help and learn the science that's being done on those ships, really understand the maritime industry. Of course, you're doing international um, health and public health when you're when you're on those vessels. We have nine aircraft. Some of your listeners may have, have heard of the hurricane hunters. We fly right into hurricanes instead of flying away from them. <laughs> So our PAs and MPs get to fly occasionally on those flights and participate in that. Our dive medical officers are out in the environment. They actually function also as dive instructors. So they're out in the water instructing new divers and participating in those uh, dive environments all over the place. We have a class we do annually in Key West, our dive centers in Seattle. And then we have marine centers uh, on multiple different co coasts across the U.S. And then NOAA headquarters is located in Silver Spring, uh, Maryland. And so talking about doing the occupational medicine, and obviously it's going to differ in what kind of environments you're in. But these PAs and NPs, do they have to be prepared to do major procedures, like almost the emergency side of stuff, like putting in chest tubes or things like that? There are some variations depending on what specialty you're in. But for example, the dive medical officers, they're doing the annual dive physicals. Um, they're responsible for reviewing all that. They don't necessarily perform all of those. Sometimes those are done by outside qualified providers. They get sent in, but the final medical decision as to whether they're fit to dive for uh, for NOAA is made by those dive NOAA dive medical officers, which are only PAs right now. And uh, if you're on the Marine side, a lot of new employee or um, physicals that are done for those safety sensitive positions on our ships. They also screen all the scientists to make sure they're suitable to be on a ship for a project. And when they're stationed on the ship and they're out, then they, of course, are doing daily kind of sick call, basic type of stuff, cold flu, but also monitoring for norovirus, uh, you know, GI type of, of things that you would see on any cruise ship as well, right? right. Uh, is it any tight living space you might, uh, you might imagine that you have to watch out for communicable type things underway. But if there is an emergency, let's say a crush injury, something like that that happens on board, then you're it. You respond. And so there's no one to help you with ACOS. It's not a team of people. It's it's you. So imagine yourself on 12-foot seas and the ship is really rocking and moving all around and you're trying to start an IV. If your IV skills aren't that great, there's no nurse to come and help you. You're it. But you could be like in just a, a land-based clinic doing regular occupational medicine and you don't have to necessarily be the person that's prepared to go on a ship. Is that correct? Well, in NOAA, not completely. Okay. <laughs> not for all our positions because sometimes the demand is much higher. It's not in a steady demand for which ships and what projects need medical officers. So occasionally there are peak times where there's a need for multiple ships to all have medical officers underway for that project. And so sometimes we have to slow down the land-based clinic activities and deploy people from our land-based clinics. So everyone's on the hook, so to speak. So I assume then when you are screening candidates to so people who want to be hired, that they're looking to bring people into NOAA that have those kind of skills already have some kind of medic type or EMT type skills, or at least work have worked in an environment where they can start IVs easily and those kind of things, correct? That's preferred, but not necessary. And a lot of our people don't necessarily have a medic or you know paramedic background necessarily. The key is, is that they're adaptable to the environment that they're applying for. So if you're a dive medical officer, you're going to be, you're also going to be a dive instructor 
Well, that means you have to be a pretty darn good swimmer and meet those minimal qualifications to be able to be a qualified dive medical officer. And so when we think of sea for like a ship, we're thinking adaptability to remote environments, austere environments. And so do you have a family situation that is amenable to you being gone for two, three months at a time? And we start asking those questions, you know, are you okay when you're in an isolated area and you... There is no interactions except for the, you know, 35 to 50 people that are on that ship with you. So do you have experiences that maybe are are similar that would let you know that you're you're adaptable to those type of remote, isolated environments, um, kind of austere environments? And so those are the things we look for, some of the questions that we ask. How many patients uh, are people usually seeing on a daily basis? A busy day, and this is going to probably floor uh, some of the people in the audience, a busy day is five patients. And that sounds like, wow, that's it? Well, it's not a typical scenario, right? And there's no support staff. So you're doing all the case management, all the follow-up, all the calls. You're starting the IVs. You're doing the blood pressures. You're doing all the paperwork. And there is no assistant, no administrative assistant, no nurse. That changes things considerably when you don't have that all that support system around you. And so, five patients is, is actually keeps you pretty darn busy. In addition to all the other responsibilities and collateral duties that you get put on you as a medical officer. The nice thing, though, if you're a Type A personality, is you get to shape that to a degree. This It's not prefab. Somebody doesn't come down and hand you a schedule. You get to shape that day and prioritize which things are most important that day that you're going to focus on um, to a degree. That's a great deal of freedom and joy uh, when you get to shape your day a little bit. So that kind of leads me to my question. I was going to ask like, what autonomy is like for PAs and NPs, but it sounds like you're operating, for the most part, very autonomously. And I assume that there are just physicians available if you needed? We do. Um, we have physicians that we can we can call in those remote environments and and uh, can collaborate with. So our ships are our scientific vessels aren't um, speedy vessels. <laughs> They're not really fast. So there are some places that our ships will be where we're five days in any direction before you can get to shore. And so if something major happens, five days away is not even close enough to helicopter someone off of the ship. And so It could be days that you have to stabilize a patient by yourself to get to the point where you can evacuate and get the definitive care. So a lot of autonomy. We've already talked a lot about some of the cool things you get to do at NOAA, but just in general, what do you think are the things that people would really love about working for the public health service slash NOAA? Broadly speaking, for for PHS, I think it's the sense of service and serving communities, underserved populations, people that really need access to good quality care. So NOAA specifically, I I think that the public health officers assigned to this agency are really drawn to its mission, which we had touched on, I know, a little bit earlier. I'm sure I didn't do it justice because NOAA does so much. Um, But I think also the patient population, our scientists, just, just the broad breadth of people that we have working in this agency are passionate about what they do. And to serve a patient population that's so passionate about something that benefits the planet. And I think people really get a, a reward out of that. And then in addition to that, that kind of same vein is that the employees of NOAA are so appreciative of the services that they get. And you don't always get that, right? And then lastly, I would say freedom to innovate healthcare delivery. So not only do you get to shape maybe your schedule, but you also get to shape health initiatives within the agency. And that's unique as well. And I was thinking when you were talking too, it must just be fascinating to be around those people and the conversations you must have. I think it would just be a fascinating place to be. It is very much so. And I'm a bit of a, a weather science geek myself. So I just ask tons of questions. They're so passionate about what they do. And how can you not be passionate about taking care of them? So those are the good things about it. If people are looking and think this job may be for them, what are the things that you would tell them to to seriously consider that may be challenges or or negatives about this position? I would say there's two two primary things I would I would focus on here to consider. 
that remote austere environment, if you're going to be on a ship is that can be tough for some people, right? Uh, if you really just get motion sick easy, you might be the person that's out on the back deck filling a bucket <laughs> and that's no <laughs> fun, right? And there's ways that you can overcome that. Most people do overcome that. But probably the thing that is toughest for people is that occasional time away from home. And for some assignments, it can be pretty lengthy up to a total. It's usually not consecutive, but a total of six months out of the year. They're seeing the world. They're experiencing a lot of amazing things, but it, that's not for everybody, obviously. So if people are interested in this and it's something they want to check out more, what is the website that they go to? And is that where they hook up with a recruiter? So it's really, really easy. I'll direct you to the Commission Corps U.S. Public Health Service website that has all the information information. It will talk about benefits, criteria, but then you can start the application. There's a, a huge button right there, right on the landing page that says apply. And uh, you just hit that and you start walking through the steps. And if somebody wanted to talk to a recruiter, can they get to a recruiter through that web page as well? They can, yes. By starting that process, that's how you get to a recruiter. Oh, okay. Okay. Any last thoughts? Anything else you want to say? If you're that person that likes to be able to jump from maybe position to position and try different things out, I mean, the door is just so wide open to to try different things in the public health service, including NOAA. Um, yeah. And I think that's a great point for people who like variety. Being in the public health service, you can, once you're in, you can move around to different positions without losing that seniority and all of those benefits that you built up. Well, thank you so much, Captain Rathke. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And thanks for sharing with us all this information about NOAA and the Public Health Service. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a pleasure talking with you as well. And uh, I really appreciate your interest in public health and NOAA. And thank you for what you do. I get so excited. And I say this every time I get excited when I do these interviews and I find out all these opportunities. I get a little sad because I'm older and some of these opportunities are not open to me. But my hope is that in bringing this information to you, that you can shape your career and start thinking about making your career what you want it to be. So if you're watching this and maybe this opportunity isn't the right one for you, but you want to know what all PAs and NPs can do in medicine, you can watch these playlists here. Thanks for joining me today. Take care, stay sane, and I'll see you next time on The Medicine Couch. Bye.